What's up my stat stars? Have you ever wondered with birth weights, rolling die, women's shoe sizes, blood pressure, and IQ scores all have in common? Well, they all follow the normal distribution. We're gonna learn all about it in this video. In this video, we're gonna cover the normal distribution, all of the fun key characteristics that apply to it. But with the normal distribution, you can also do what's called normal calculations. If you're interested in that, please check out a lot of the other videos I have on the topic. Now, if you like learning from me, please also check out my ultimate review packet that contains study guides, unit summary videos, and practice sheets that make sure that you're ready for every single unit in AP Statistics as well as the AP Statistics exam in May. Now, when we collect data on a quantitative variable, we often like to talk about its distribution. And one of the key characteristics we examine is the shape. We could do this primarily with a histogram. Now, a histogram is meant to look at the shape of the overall distribution for a sample of data. But if we want to try to infer what might be true for the larger population that that sample came from, we could do so with what's called a density curve. A density curve is used to model what the population might look like. A density curve is always above the horizontal axis and it has an area of exactly one underneath it or 100%, representing that 100% of observations fall beneath the curve. Now, the area below the curve and above any interval on the x-axis represents the proportion of data in that interval. Density curves come in all different shapes, but one shape that is very common is called the normal curve. The normal curve can be characterized by being symmetric, unimodal, or single-peaked, and many often call it mound-shaped or bell-shaped. Now this means that the large proportion of data is in the center of the curve, and as we move to the extremes on the far left and far right, we see less and less observations. All normal curves have the same shape, unimodal and symmetric. However, any specific normal curve can be described with its mean, mu, and standard deviation, sigma. We don't use X bar and S here because density curves like the normal curve are used to model populations, which are described with parameters. The normal distribution and the calculations and predictions we can make with it only make sense when we're referring to the larger population of data. The mean could be higher or lower, which would move the normal model up or down. The standard deviation could also be higher or lower, which would simply spread the normal model out more or less, making it more narrow. Here we see two normal models sharing the same mean of 24, but the one in red has a standard deviation of two, making it much more narrow than the one in blue, which has a standard deviation of six we can see how the spread changes as the standard deviation gets smaller or larger. Normal distributions are really important for a few reasons. One, they are a good description for some real data like the ones we mentioned earlier. Let's take a look at some of those examples. Here's the distribution of the birth weights of babies in grams. Notice the mean in the center of 3,500 grams, but notice as we move to the extremes, far left and far right, we see less and less babies at those birth weights. Guess what? It falls in normal distribution, looking like a mound or a bell shape. Here we're looking at the distribution of the dystolic blood pressures of men. Same thing we notice. Mean in the middle, where a large proportion of data is, as we get to the extremes, the proportion of data rapidly decreases. Meaning less and less men have really low blood pressures or less and less men have really high blood pressures. Even women's shoe sizes follow the same distribution with the majority of women in the middle and less and less at the extremes of two, three, four shoe size or 13, 14, 15. Again, following the normal distribution. Normal curves are also used as approximations for the results of many sorts of chance outcomes or random phenomena. Let's take a look at an example. When you roll two die and add up the outcome, that's considered a chance event because you don't know exactly what that outcome is gonna be. But if we roll two die over and over and over again and record the outcome of the sum of the two die, we notice a trend that, guess what, follows the normal distribution. Outcomes like two and 12 are very, very uncommon where outcomes in the middle, six, seven, eight, are very likely. Drawing a normal curve is really easy. We already know the shape, and all we need to know is the mean and standard deviation. IQ scores of humans are a great example of quantitative data that falls in normal distribution. They have a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. We label the mean in the middle with 100, and then we go up and down one standard deviation at a time. Now, the normal model is continuous and extends indefinitely in both directions. So when we draw it, we typically don't extend beyond negative three or positive three standard deviations from the mean. 
The reason for this is something called the empirical rule. The empirical rule tells us that 68% of all observations under a normal curve are from one to negative one standard deviations, 95% of all observations are within two standard deviations, and 99.7% of all observations are within three standard deviations of the mean. So a value outside of negative three or positive three would be extremely rare, unlikely, and significant if it did happen. Looking back at the normal distribution for IQ scores, notice how a value of 115 is also labeled as one, meaning that it's one standard deviation above the mean. Likewise, 85 is labeled negative one since it is one standard deviation below the mean. Labeling values not by their actual value, but by how many standard deviations they are from the mean is called normalizing or standardizing the scores. What is cool about this is we can now put any variable that follows a normal distribution onto the same curve as long as the scores are normalized. This allows us to compare values from different distributions since they are all on the same curve. Here we have one curve with IQ scores, men's diastolic blood pressure, and the weights of frogs all together. This curve is called the standard normal curve. It utilizes standardized scores which again measure how many standard deviations a value is from the mean. All values can be put onto this curve as long as they are normalized or standardized. To convert an observation's value to a standardized score, it's a really simple formula. We abbreviate this with what's called a z-score because it's a standardized score. To calculate a z-score for an observation, it's really, really simple. All you have to do is subtract the mean from the observation and then divide that by the standard deviation. Z-scores have no units. They simply tell you how many standard deviations a value is above or below the mean. Finding the Z-score for values allows us to compare the seemingly uncomparable. For example, a frog with a weight of 57 grams is equivalent to a human being having an IQ of 130 or a man with a diastolic blood pressure of 100. Because all normal distributions are the same when we standardize them, we can find proportions under any normal curve. For example, if we wanted to find the proportion of observations that are above a standardized score of 1.5, we could use either a normal table, a TI-84 calculator, or a program like Desmos. And in any of those methods, we find out that 6.68% of observations are above a z-score of 1.5 in any normal distribution. Here's another example looking at the proportion of observations below a z-score of negative 2.25. Once again, we could use a normal table, a calculator, or Desmos to find this proportion. But through any of those methods, we find out that 1.22% of all observations will fall below a z-score of negative 2.25. So in this video, I hope you've learned a little bit about the normal distribution and why it is so important. And trust me, plan on using it a lot in the rest of your statistics course. Don't forget to check out some of my other videos that cover the normal distribution and normal distribution calculations, as well as checking out my ultimate review packet for study guides, review videos, and much, much more.